Then Robert uh, uh, Piercy is from the University of Regina, Champion College in uh, Canada, both specialists of uh, 20th century uh, uh, continental and other philosophy. Uh, I think, uh, Robert, you will go uh, first. Is, is that right? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Good. One of the axioms of Ricoeur's hermeneutics mm -hmm. is that interpretation culminates in application. Following Gadamer, Ricoeur claims that we have not truly understood a text until we have brought it to bear on our own situation. In particular, we have not truly understood a philosopher's work until we have asked what it says about our own interests and concerns. The act of subjectivity, Ricoeur writes, is not so much what initiates understanding as what terminates it. This terminal act can be characterized as appropriation, so I can but appropriating a text involves a delicate balancing act. On the one hand, if an appropriation is too inventive, it ceases to be an appropriation of the original and becomes sheer creation. Appropriation always has a creative dimension, but as Gadamer says, it is above all a matter of subordinating oneself ourselves to the text's claim. On the other hand, if an interpretation is not inventive enough, then it ceases to be an appropriation of the original and becomes passive reproduction. It seems clear that a successful appropriation will avoid both extremes. But it is not clear how to avoid these extremes and thus produce a successful appropriation. Ricoeur offers a little explicit guidance here, which is understandable. There are no algorithms in interpretation, and even if there were, they would only raise the further question of how to interpret them. If we wish to know what a successful Ricoeurian appropriation looks like, we can do no better than to turn to examples, specific cases in which Ricoeur takes himself to have successfully appropriated the ideas of others, other philosophers. My goal is to shed some light on Ricoeur's view of application, or appropriation, I'm using these interchangeably, by examining his reading of one of his Anglo-American contemporaries, Alistair McIntyre. I focus on the sixth study of oneself as another, where Ricoeur appropriates McIntyre's notion of the narrative unity of a life. I then contrast Ricoeur's appropriation with Richard Rorty's appropriation of the same notion in his essay, Freud and Moral Reflection. This contrast reveals two distinct ways of appropriating a text, ways that resemble each other in one important respect while differing in another. The similarity is that neither Ricoeur nor Rorty is particularly worried about, um, sorry. Sorry. The similarity is that neither Ricoeur nor Rorty is particularly worried about being faithful to McIntyre's intentions. Both take for granted that appropriating the notion of narrative unity means using it in ways McIntyre might not have imagined. Thus, in navigating between the skill of overinvention and the charybdis of overfaithfulness, both Ricoeur and Rorty steer closer to skill. The difference is that while Ricoeur and Rorty put McIntyre in the service of their own agendas, they put him in the service of different sorts of agendas and hope to achieve different things by doing so. Ricoeur uses McIntyre's work to answer a question that McIntyre does not explicitly raise, but might have raised, given the logic of his larger project. Moreover, there is reason to think that McIntyre could accept the relevance of Ricoeur's question to his own project. He did not integrate his question into his project, but he could have. Rorty, by contrast, appropriates narrative unity in ways McIntyre could not possibly accept, in ways that are inconsistent with the guiding assumptions of McIntyre's project. McIntyre not only did not raise Rorty's question, he could not raise it without abandoning his own project. The conclusion I draw from all this is that appropriation is governed by a distinctive norm. Many have argued that a legitimate reading of a figure attributes to that figure only views she could ultimately come to accept as a correct description of her own views. I argue that an analogous but higher order norm governs appropriation. A legitimate appropriation of an author's work puts that work in the service of a project that the author could ultimately be brought to accept as consistent with her own. At a minimum, this rules out appropriations in which the appropriator's project is, in, is incompatible with the, figure, with the project of the figure being appropriated. Recur's appropriation passes this test because it applies McIntyre's ideas to a project that McIntyre could have accepted as an extension of his own. Rorty's does not. It uses McIntyre's ideas in the service of a project that, if followed through, will cause McIntyre's project to unravel. Rorty's appropriation is thus a self-defeating attempt to read McIntyre against himself. To be clear, I am not suggesting that it is never legitimate to read a thinker against herself. My claim is simply that when we do, 
We should call it something other than appropriation. So let me start with the source material. McIntyre introduces the notion of the narrative unity of a life in the crucial 15th chapter of After Virtue. This chapter is where McIntyre sketches an alternative to what he calls the Enlightenment Project. The Enlightenment Project is the attempt to justify moral norms by invoking some feature of human nature as it currently is, without appealing to a conception of human nature as it ought to be. McIntyre thinks this project is bound to fail, since moral norms, he claims, are essentially means to an end, ways of attaining the human good. Without a teleological understanding of humanity, moral norms will always look arbitrary and indefensible. But McIntyre grants that the most common pre-modern source of such a conception, a metaphysical biology of the sort endorsed by Aristotle, is no longer plausible. The challenge is to find something else that might play this role. McIntyre suggests that social practices fit the bill. We all participate in organized collective activities that can be per performed well or badly, and they're defined by the ends they pursue. Successful participation in a practice, according to McIntyre, requires moral virtues. The boxer will not succeed at boxing if he lacks courage. The scholar will not finish her books if she is governed by sloth. Virtues, however, are not exercised on isolated occasions. They're stable character traits, traits that manifest themselves over long periods of time. To ask whether someone possesses justice or courage is to ask about her life as a whole, not just her behavior on this or that occasion. To overcome the Enlightenment Project, then, we must look to the virtues that sustain practices. And to invoke the virtues, we must see an agent's life as unified. McIntyre's project, in short, assumes a life that can be conceived and evaluated as a whole. To make this assumption plausible, McIntyre introduces the notion of the narrative unity of a life. His claim is that human life possesses the unity of a story, that we all live out narratives in our lives, and that it is because we understand our own lives in terms of the narratives that we live out that the form of narrative is appropriate for understanding the actions of others. McIntyre argues that narrative unity is the most basic concept required for making sense of action. This is counterintuitive. In our pre-reflective moments, and sometimes explicitly in the philosophy of action, we tend to think that what is most basic are individual actions, while series of actions, such as narratives, are concatenations of them. McIntyre thinks this is exactly backwards. An individual action, far from being basic, is intelligible only as a moment in a possible or actual history. Consider the ways in which we make sense of people's behavior. Any action admits of indefinitely many characterizations. The movements of my finger on a computer keyboard could be described as attempts to loosen my stiff fingers, to finish an article, to earn a paycheck, or to show the critic who reviewed my last book how wrong he was. The adequacy of any given characterization depends on my intentions and my intentions are a function of my long-term projects. In order to show that what I'm really doing as I move my fingers is responding to a critic, one must situate this action in a larger story, a story of an unfair book review, a damaged reputation, an author in rage. To make sense of the action just is to locate it in some such story. These stories are collective as well as individual. My response to a critic appears not just in the story of my life, but in the story of my critic's life, my long-suffering spouse's life, and much more remotely, in the histories of the philosophical profession and the university. Narrative, in short, I'm quoting McIntyre here, narrative is not the work of poets, dramatists, and novelists reflecting upon events which had no narrative order before it was imposed. On the contrary, human actions in general are enacted narratives. For McIntyre, however, the narrative unity of a life is not just a requirement or a presupposition of moral theory, it is itself a moral achievement. All stories are unified to some degree, but some are more unified than others. As I live my life, I constantly ask myself what I will do next, which chapter I will add to the story of my life. Some answers to this question unify my, my life story more effectively than others. McIntyre goes so far as to suggest that one course of action is better than another to the extent that it turns my life into a more unified story. He writes, this is from After Virtue. In what does the unity of an individual life consist? The answer is that its unity is the unity of a narrative embodied in a single life. To ask, what is the good for me, is to ask how best I might live out that unity and bring it to completion. To ask, what is the good for man, 
is to ask what all answers to the former question must have in common. That narrative unity itself is morally desirable explains, in McIntyre's view, why we should value the virtues. The virtues, according to McIntyre, are those dispositions which will not only sustain practices and enable us to achieve those goods internal to practices, but which will also sustain us in the relevant kind of quest for the good. Narrative unity also provides a way of choosing between courses of action that might seem equally virtuous. Other things being equal, the more virtuous course of action is the one that better unifies the story of my life. Now, let me turn to Recur's and Rorty's appropriations of the notion of the narrative unity of life. To appropriate a philosopher's work is to enlist it in one's own philosophical project, to bring it to bear on one's own interests and concerns. In assessing these appropriations, therefore, the crucial question is the use to which Rorty and, and, Re and Recur put it. To which projects do they apply this notion, and what do they hope to gain by doing so? Recur's appropriation appears in oneself as another, so it serves that book's project of developing a hermeneutics of selfhood that will avoid the extremes of an exalted subject and a humiliated subject. Its location in the book's sixth study gives it the further task of exploring the mediations that narrative theory can affect between action theory and moral theory. Narrative unity is therefore a way of mediating two perspectives, that from which one asks, who is the agent of action, and that from which one asks, who is the moral subject of imputation? Clearly, then, Ricoeur uses the notion of narrative unity in the service of a very different project than McIntyre. McIntyre uses it to legitimize moral theory in general and to defend the virtue-theoretic approach that he favors in particular. These issues do not arise for Ricoeur in oneself as another, since the project of oneself as another takes for granted the existence and the coherence of moral theory. The only question is how moral theory is related to the philosophy of action. Ricoeur's focus soon becomes narrower still. Right before discussing McIntyre, Ricoeur says that he is particularly interested in the supports and anticipations that narrative theory offers to ethical questioning. Narrative theory does not just mediate moral theory and the philosophy of action. It also helps mediate the concepts and the perspectives internal to moral theory itself. One such concept is that of a practice. As we saw with McIntyre, a practice is an organized collective activity that pursues a distinctive good and is defined by its own standards of excellence. Ricoeur gives the examples of professions, games, and arts, and he agrees with McIntyre that these practices play crucial roles in ethical reflection. Another such concept, a, dis a contrasting concept to the concept of practice, is the concept that Ricoeur calls the global project of an existence. This concept is used when agents reflect on their lives in an entirely general way. Ricoeur suggests, however, that agents rarely adopt this utterly global perspective. I do sometimes reflect on my life's overall shape and direction, but I normally do so by linking this direction to a specific domain. Rather than reflecting on my life full stop, I normally reflect on my professional life, or my family life, or my leisure time. These sorts of reflections are concerned with my life as a whole, but to use Kantian language, they schematize it. They take an extremely abstract concept and give it a concrete meaning by incarnating it in a particular domain. Ricoeur calls this intermediate concept a life plan. A life plan is a vast practical unit, more vast than any practice. The practices of teaching and scholarly writing are just elements of my professional life as a whole. My professional life, in turn, is just one element of the global project of my existence. Life plans, Ricoeur claims, take shape, a shape that is mobile and moreover changeable, thanks to a back and forth movement between more or less distinct ideals, which must now be specified, and the weighing advantages and disadvantages of the choice of a particular life plan on the level of practices. Despite his use of different terminology, Ricoeur suggests that life plans are what McIntyre really has in mind when he speaks of the narrative unity of a life. The phrase narrative unity of a life might suggest that this notion is identical with what Ricoeur calls the global project of one's existence, one's life viewed in a maximally general way. But this is misleading because, as Ricoeur points out, <clears throat> McIntyre is mainly considering stories told in the thick of everyday activity, 
stories about particular courses of action in particular circumstances. Only rarely and in extreme moments do we reflect on and try to enhance the unity of our lives understood as completely general wholes. More commonly, we reflect on our life stories as they appear through the lens of some life plan or other, professional life, family life, and so on. Thus, a major difference between McIntyre's use of the narrative unity of a life and Recur's appropriation of this notion is that while McIntyre takes it to be an ultimate notion, Recur takes it to be an intermediate one. Another difference concern, concerns Recur's goal. What does he gain by transforming narrative unity from an ultimate notion into an intermediate one? The obvious answer, I think, is that doing so allows us to see narrative unity as governed by something, answerable to something higher. In particular, it allows life plans themselves to be ethically evaluated. For McIntyre, the narrative unity of a life is an ultimate. Actions, practices, and virtues are valuable because, and to the extent that, they further this unity. There is no value higher than narrative unity, nothing to which narrative unity itself must answer. Any life plan that unifies my existence more effectively than its competitors is good, and there is no standpoint from which that life plan may be ethically criticized. McIntyre's position is thus open to embarrassing counterexamples. Consider a consistent moral monster, an agent who single-handedly devotes his existence to inflicting suffering on others. McIntyre seems unable to criticize such an agent, since McIntyre's only question is whether one's life is as unified as can be, not how it is unified. Of course, McIntyre would no doubt insist that the moral monster's life will never be as unified as the virtuous agent's. But whether this is so is an empirical question whose answer is far from clear. And I, for one, think it unwise to stake the viability of the ent entire ethical project on the hope that this matter will turn out one way rather than another. Such worries, however, do not arise from Recur. Since he takes narrative unity to be, to be an intermediate notion, he can claim that it is subject to its still higher values. In particular, Recur's way of appropriating narrative unity is what allows him to insist, in the eighth study of oneself as another, that life plans must pass through the sieve of the moral norm. It is because he does not see narrative unity as ultimate that he is able to distinguish between good and evil ways of unifying a life. McIntyre, I'm suggesting, lacks the means to draw such a distinction. We should note two things about Recur's appropriation. First, in keeping with the goal of using McIntyre to further his own agenda, Recur does not hesitate to ignore McIntyre's intentions or even to describe McIntyre's work in ways that do violence to those intentions. One example is that Recur mischaracterizes McIntyre's view about the relation between individual actions and life stories. After Virtue makes clear, I think, that the relation of dependence between these notions is one way. Life stories make individual actions intelligible, but not the reverse. Recur, however, says that for McIntyre, there is a twofold movement of ascending complexification, starting from basic actions and from practices, and of descending specifications starting from the vague and mobile horizon of ideals and practices in light of which a human life apprehends itself in its oneness. So on this view, actions and lives are moments of a hermeneutic circle, and that fits nicely with Recur's project, but I think it is clearly not McIntyre's view. Recur also mischaracterizes McIntyre's view of the relation between history and fiction, or really his approach to history and fiction. Recur says that McIntyre does not attach any decisive importance to the split between literary fictions and the stories that he says are enacted. In fact, McIntyre attaches considerable importance to this split. And while Recur may disagree with what, with what McIntyre says about it, it is just not true that McIntyre ignores this distinction. In short, Recur's appropriation sometimes plays fast and loose with McIntyre's intentions. In most of his writings, Recur is remarkably careful in reconstructing the intentions of those he discusses. In the context of an appropriation of McIntyre's work, these intentions are simply not a relevant concern. So that's the first thing to note. The second thing to note concerns the relation between McIntyre's project and the use to which Recur puts it. Recur transforms the notion of narrative unity from an ultimate notion into an intermediate one in order to answer a question that McIntyre does not pose. How can we assess an agent's life plan? And in the most extreme case, how can we rule out consistent moral monsters who unify their lives in evil ways? McIntyre does not explicitly pose this question, but he could pose it. 
Nothing about the question is inconsistent with the project of articulating a virtue theory without a metaphysical biology. Furthermore, McIntyre probably should pose it. A virtue theory that makes unity the ultimate value is vulnerable to objections concerning defective life plans, not all of which are as extreme as the one involving consistent moral monsters. I cannot believe McIntyre would dismiss these objections out of hand. I cannot imagine him denying that some ways of unifying a life are themselves ethically problematic. In short, McIntyre does not himself raise the worries that lead Ricoeur to transform narrative unity from an ultimate notion into an intermediate one. But he could, and he probably should. If he does not, his entire project will appear quite dubious. Contrast Ricoeur's appropriation with that of another of McIntyre's contemporaries, Richard Rorty. Like Ricoeur, Rorty lists the notion of narrative unity out of after virtue and puts it in the service of a very different project. Rorty's project, however, is a generalized decentering of ethics, a decentering inspired by Freud. To decenter ethics is to purge it of the idea of a, I'm quoting from Rorty here, of a central self, our conscience, the standard setting authoritative part of us, with universal truths, general principles, and a common human nature. To decenter ethics is to abandon the idea that ethical reflection involves listening to the commands of some deep, true part of ourselves especially when those commands conflict with the wishes of supposedly less true, more peripheral parts of our nature. The paradigm of this central self is the Kantian moral agent, whose autonomy stands in sharp contrast with the heteronomy of all non-moral maxims. It is a self that is independent of mechanistic nature, a self capable of exempting itself from cause and effect, and determining the will through practical reason alone. But Rorty finds many other examples, even Kierkegaard and Sartre, whose leaps of faith and being for itself amount to what he calls a sort of blank space in the middle of a machine, a hole in being. Rorty is too much of a pragmatist and an historicist to believe in true selves. So he looks to Freud for a way out of scented ethics. He thinks Freud's contribution to this endeavor is to have, and I quote Rorty here, to have made conscience just one more, not particularly central, part of a larger homogeneous machine. He identified the sense of duty with the internalization of a host of idiosyncratic accidental episodes. He saw the voice of conscience not as the voice of the part of the soul that deals with generalities, as opposed to the part that deals with particulars, but rather as the usually distorted memory of certain very particular events. Freud shows, that, show, Freud shows what becomes of ethics in a thoroughly mechanized world, a world in which human beings, like everything else, are understood to be complex machines. A machine has no center. It cannot be divided into a central essence that provides a built-in purpose and a set of peripheral accidents. Any machine may be used for indefinitely many purposes. If we see ourselves as machines, our ethical task is not to find our center and learn to live well, but rather to invent a use for ourselves. Instead of striving to see ourselves more clearly, clearly enough to know how to act in any situation, we should view ethical theory as a tool for bringing about desirable change. <coughs> Rorty brings McIntyre into this discussion because if we endorse the mechanization and decentering of the world, we must respond to those who see the mechanization of nature as a prelude to barbarism. McIntyre seems to be the clearest representative of this view. Rorty's strategy for answering McIntyre involves wielding the notion of narrative unity against McIntyre's intentions. He accepts McIntyre's claim that narrative unity is an ethical achievement, and that all else being equal, the best course of action is the one that allows me to turn my life into the most unified story available. But he argues that if we value unified lives, and we should, then we ought to view human beings as Freud does. Freud, I'll quote Rorty here, Freud enables us to construct richer and more plausible narratives of this ad hoc sort. More plausible because they will cover all the actions one performs in the course of one's life, even the silly, cruel, and self-destructive actions. More generally, Freud helped us to see that the attempt to put together such a narrative, one that minimizes neither con the, con the contingency nor the decisive importance of the input in the machine that each of us is, must take the place of an attempt to find the function common to all such machines. If one takes Freud's advice, Freud's advice, one finds psychological narratives without heroes or heroines. For neither Sartrean freedom, nor the will, nor the instincts, nor an internalization of the culture, nor anything else will play the role of the true self. Instead, one tells the story of the whole machine as machine, without choosing a particular set of springs and wheels as protagonist. Such stories are obviously very different from the ones McIntyre imagines agents telling themselves about their lives. But they are, Rorty insists, more unified than the latter sort of story, because a story without an ethical center is bound to be more unified than a story with one. 
A decentered ethics thus meets McIntyre's standards more fully than McIntyre's own ethics. In some ways, Rorty's appropriation of McIntyre is similar to Ricoeur's. Like Ricoeur, Rorty says almost nothing about McIntyre's intentions, and he plays fast and loose with McIntyre's stated goals. For McIntyre, for instance, narrative unity is closely linked to moral motivation. McIntyre worries about those who see no reason to act morally, and he appeals to narrative unity to explain why they should. Agents should act virtually, or virtuously because the virtues are ways of unifying one's life story, and we all care about the unity of our life stories. But Rorty denies that we need reasons to live romantically or treat others decently or be treated decently ourselves. Philosophers should just stop trying to answer these questions and restrict, ourselves to, restrict themselves to questions like, if I do this rather than that now, what story will I tell myself later on? Thus, for Rorty, as for Recur, appropriating the notion of narrative unity means using it to serve an agenda quite different from McIntyre's. As we've seen, however, Recur's agenda is one that McIntyre does not explicitly endorse, but could and probably should. Contrast this with Rorty's agenda. Rorty wishes to decenter the entire tradition of ethical practice and reflection. He wants to jettison the very idea that a deep, true self that is the proper subject of ethical deliberation and ethics. In opposition to McIntyre, who wants to resurrect an Aristotelian approach to ethics, Rorty characterizes his project as a discarding of the last vestiges of the Aristotelian ways of thinking that make our moral discourse coherent. Rorty's project, this discarding of the last vestiges of Aristotelianism, is incompatible with McIntyre's in two ways. First, the contents of the projects are incompatible. McIntyre's project is to find an alternative to the Enlightenment project. He wants to justify the ethical undertaking without moving from premises about human nature as it is to conclusions about how we ought to act. But Rorty's decentering project denies that there is such a thing as the ethical undertaking. From a decenter perspective, conscience is just one more, not particularly central, part of a larger homogeneous machine. The sense of duty merely a product of the internalization of a host of idiosyncratic accidental episodes. Rorty voices this skepticism in many of his writings, suggesting, for example, that the distinction between prudence and morality should be replaced with Dewey's distinction between routine and non-routine social relationships. McIntyre could not accept any of this without abandoning his project. The problem is not that he and Rorty disagree about some particular point of theory. His project is compatible with any number of different positions on the nature of ethics, but it is incompatible with the claim that ethics does not exist. McIntyre's project is also formally incompatible with Rorty's. As we have seen, Rorty's project involves discarding the last vestiges of the Aristotelian ethical tradition. It calls for a radical break in intellectual history. But McIntyre's entire project is incompatible with radical breaks. In his view, we are never in a position to sweep the past aside and start fresh. We live our lives as enacted stories. And the question is always how we will continue the story in which we find ourselves. Tearing up that story and starting a new one is never an option. This is true of traditions as well as individual lives. A tradition, McIntyre claims, is an argument extended through time in which certain fundamental agreements are defined in response to conflict. This does not mean that later stages in a tradition's history must endorse everything done at earlier stages. On the contrary, attempts to amend or redirect a tradition can be as formative and important a relation to a tradition as any other. But redirecting a tradition is a matter of adding a surprising new story to a larger, uh, to a surprising new chapter to a larger and older story. It is not a matter of sweeping the older story aside. A demand for radical ruptures is another way in which Rorty's project is incompatible with McIntyre's. To conclude, both Recur and Rorty use McIntyre's work in ways McIntyre would not expect. But Recur's appropriation coheres sufficiently with McIntyre's project that McIntyre could come to see it as a legitimate extension of it. Rorty's does not. It articulates a standpoint that McIntyre could not adopt without abandoning his project. From this perspective, Ricoeur's reading appears to be a successful appropriation, or at least a potentially successful one. Rorty's, on the other hand, appears not to be an appropriation at all. Again, I'm not suggesting that we should never read an author against herself. My claim is simply that there's a limit to how inventive an appropriation can be before it ceases to be an appropriation and becomes something else. I think Ricoeur agrees. I think Rorty does not. Thank you. Thank you very much. I suggest we start uh, immediately with uh, questions uh, for Robert. Let's start. Thanks, Rob. It's a very interesting paper. Um, and one's a comment, and then another. Um, is my second part's a question. 
I find it, it's interesting that McIntyre just doesn't take up Ricoeur on, on his criticisms of uh, the narrative unity of life, even if Ricoeur is misrepresented to some extent. Because I've been in different forums, in particular with Oxford with Stephen Mulhall, where the kinds of critical questions that he poses to McIntyre are ones that have already been articulated mm. by Ricoeur, and this mm. seems to be kind of a, a, a gap of communication on both sides. Yeah, I agree. Um, my question has a, a bit to do with McIntyre to see what you think about this question of whether. Um, to what extent 